All right, finishing the introduction to uh, On the Cosmic Mysteries of Jesus Christ by St. Maximus the Confessor. Last section is entitled New Birth and the Christian's Progress in Virtue. It's a few pages. Um, so, drawing from the spiritual treasury of the Bible, from the wisdom of the fathers, especially the Cappadocians and Cyril of Alexandria, from the sages of his own Byzantine monastic tradition, figures as prolific as Evagrius, Evagrius in the 4th century and Sophronius in his own, from inspired mystical theologians like Pseudo-Dionysus the Arepagate, and from the breadth and depth of his own experience and theological ingenuity, Maximus the Confessor generated his own synthetic vision of the spiritual life of the Christian as a microdrama of the larger macrodrama of salvation history. Accordingly, all Christians are called to an ascetic life, broadly understood insofar as every believer must aspire through disciplined pra practice, praxis, and contemplation, theoria, exercising every level of the life of the soul and the body to participate in the transfiguration of the cosmos. Indeed, to be a miniature demonstration of its realization and thereby to share actively in Christ's mediation of the new creation. Given Maximus' integrative perspective, the pointing of his whole theological project toward the mystery of Jesus Christ and deep structure of his spirituality to text in his corpus is irrelevant to his theology of the Christian life. The texts, the texts in this volume, however, must most directly address his teaching on the conversion of human passibility as instrumental in the progress toward divinization. The consistent theme in Christ's vindication of the divine plan for create creaturely deification and his pioneering of a new mode for the whole of human nature, including the passable self and its faculties, which brings the creator's plan in uh, plan to full fruition. Baptism for Maximus the uh, back to baptism for Maximus is the new birth by the Spirit that roots the believer in this ongoing transformation transformative process, this new existential mode. According to Ambiguum forty two, baptism takes place among the three births to which humanity is subject and which the Savior Himself has honored. First, our original coming into being as creatures made in the image of God. Second, our baptismal birth, which confers the grace of well-being. And third, the ultimate birth of resurrection, whereby we attain to the grace of eternal well-being. Within this schema, the incarnate Lord's own baptism, and now ours, secures for Adam's fallen posterity the spiritual birth and vocation that Adam himself had lost. A birth that shares the bond of carnal birth and assures adoption in the spirit, simultaneously restoring God's intended plan, logos, for Adam and his race. For the Savior, the sequence was, first of all, incarnation and bodily birth for my sake, and so thereupon the birth in the Spirit through baptism, originally spurned by Adam, for the sake of my salvation and restoration of great by grace, or, to describe it even more vividly, my remaking, my remaking. God, as it were, connected for me the principle of my being and the principle of my well-being, bridging the separation and distance between them, that I had caused and thereby wisely drew them together in the principle of eternal being. That was a quote by Maximus, by the way. Ad Thalassium 6 takes us further into the baptismal vocation as such. Here, Thalassius recalls for Maximus the long-standing dilemma of post-baptismal sin. Given St. John's exalted language of the one baptized with water and spirit is truly born of God, how is it even possible for the baptized believer to sin? Such a question had come up much earlier in Byzantine monastic tradition, particularly during the Messalian controversy in which certain radical ascetics had questioned the efficacy of baptism to eradicate sin and secure the Christian in a state of impassibility. Maximum's uh, fifth century predecessor, Mark the Hermit, countering this Messalian anti-sacramentalism wrote that Christ, being perfect God, bestows on the baptized the grace of the Spirit. We add nothing to that grace. It is revealed to and manifested in us in proportion to our performance of the commandments and provides us the added assistance of faith until we attain to perfect manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. End quote. 
And the effect, the baptism plants the seed of grace that will continue to unfold itself in the penitent and fruit-bearing life of the believer. Maximus's response to Thalassius echoes the wisdom of this earlier tradition and brings to it his own fresh insights. Baptism, he indicates, actually entails two dimensions, two births in one. On the one hand, it implants through the believer's faith the fully potential grace of adoption in the Spirit, and on the other hand, it begins the actualization of that grace which must grow and continue through the believer's active assimilation to God. The latter, he observes, involves the conversion of free choice and of the gnomic will, as well as the acquisition of a knowledge based on the enriched based on enriched by our spiritual experiences. Clearly for Maximus, the baptismal vocation reveals a synergy of the Holy Spirit and the well, will of the graced Christian. Yet he strongly emphasizes the burden on the believer to discipline the will, to stabilize personal inclination, since the Spirit does not compel an unwilling nomi, nor baptism nullify its freedom. In his own words, quote, even if we have the spirit of adoption, who is himself the seed for enduring those begotten through baptism with the likeness of the sower, but do not present him with the will, nomi, cleansed of any inclination or disposition to something else. We therefore, even, be, be, even after being born of water and the Spirit, willingly sin. End quote. In view of this vulnerability, the life to which the baptized Christian is called is a constant assesis, assesis, a steadying of the mutable will and affections, a perpetual retraining, as it were. Gregory of Nyssa famously dealt with this mutability, understood pejoratively, pejoratively as deviance, or by the originists as the liability to stall out in the good through spiritual surfeit. Surfeit. By imagining the soul engaged in a perpetual progress or striving to embrace its ultimate desirable God. Maximus appropriates Nisa's concept, but not without revision. Cautious that such perpetual change for the better would simply amount to the soul's endless overcoming of an inherent capacity to astray from its true destiny, or even to stall because of satiety. satiety. Maximus applies his distinction between a creature's mutable quote-unquote mode of existence and its ontological prior quote-unquote natural principle, which comprehends and stabilizes its existential movements. Nevertheless, Maximus fundamentally concurs with Gregory that because God is utterly infinite and because the most natural human drive is an appetitive longing for the divine, no creature can truly exhaust its progress or be satiated, sated in communion with God. Even in the afterlife, deification is, is an ever-moving repose. In God. The Nicene image of the spiritual life as a perpetual striving towards the good and advancement from glory to glory appears frequently in Maximus's early spiritual writings and is epitomized in Ad Thalassium 17, a text clearly influenced by Gregory's great treatise, The Life of Moses. If he repudiates the originist idea that souls can potentially stall in a state of spiritual satiety, Maximus nonetheless acknowledges that the Christian ascetic can experience a peeking out perilously associated with the vice of vainglory. The subject of Athalsium 17 is uh, an otherwise obscure narrative from Moses' career. God commissioned Moses to travel to Egypt, and en route he was stopped by an angel who indicated him for not having circumcised his son indicted him for not circumcising his son. Moses appears superficially innocent, having not been forewarned of the need to circumcise the boy. On the, more, on the moral and spiritual level, however, this is the story of the divine commissioning of the soul to enter the Egypt of the heart and liberate godly thoughts. Moses symbolizes every ascetic mind, nous, who, summoned to pursue the way of virtue but distracted by illusions and passions, fails to circumcise thoughts spiritually, thus indicating the word of God to enter like an angel and smite the conscience. For, quote, the road of virtues in no way admits of any stalling on the part of those who walk in it, and the immobili immobility, immobility of virtue is the beginning of vice, end quote. Citing Gregory of Nyssa's own cherished scriptural text, Paul, Paul's image of the runner straining to reach the victory line and striving towards the goal of the upward call in Christ, Maximus encourages all Christians to stay the course toward God, aided by a new kind of angels, the principles, logi, and modes, thro tropi, of the virtues. 
For Maximus the Confessor, the Christian's growth in the grace of the Spirit is at once a progress of discipline, reasoning, and will, but also a transformation at the level of appetite and of the soul's deep-seated desires. Deification in this perspective entails that the ultimate alignment of the whole array of human affections with the soul's natural desire for God. It is, moreover, the final victory of love, the cosmic virtue that both reorients the passions and disposes the Christian in a perfect relation with God, with neighbor, and indeed with all creation. As Maximus writes in an early letter to John the Cubulcarius, dating around 626, quote, Love gives faith the reality of what it believes and hope the presence of what it hopes for and the enjoyment of what it is present. Love alone, properly speaking, proves that the human person is in the image of the Creator by making his self-determination submit to reason, not bending reason under it and persuading the inclination to follow nature and not in the way to be at variance with the logos of nature. In this way, we are all, as it were, one nature so that we are able to have one inclination and one will with God and with one another, not having any discord with God or one another, whenever by the law of grace, through which by our inclination the law of nature is renewed, we choose what is ultimate. All right, that is the end of the uh, introduction. Um, And next we will get into some of the ambigua.